All right. <clears throat> all right. So this is unit three. Unit three is all about ionic bonds and metallic bonds. And uh, we're already pretty familiar with ionic bonds from naming, but we'll talk about a little bit more of that nuance during this chapter. Uh, so ionic bonds, ionic bonds form when oppositely charged ions are electro electrostatically attracted to one another. So what does that word mean, electrostatically? So positive charges are attracted to negative charges, and then it's not involved in the, well, it is involved, I guess, a little. Negative charges are going to repel other negative charges. Positive charges are going to repel other positive charges. Uh, it's sort of similar to the way magnets work. So we've played with magnets in our lifetimes. Uh, you never get to really play with charges, but it's similar but different than magnets. And the net charge in an ionic bond, the overall charge of the compound once it forms, is always going to be neutral. So they transfer enough electrons or they pair up in enough ions to always cancel out the overall charge. Uh, when ionic bonds form, they form these lattice structures. They do not just pair up individually. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So you'll have, you know, chloride ion and it's going to be surrounded by sodium ions. Now, like I was just saying, those positive ions are repelling one another, so they space themselves out as much as they can, but they're all attracted back to the negative ion and so you get this distribution around there. And then each of the sodium ions are going to attract the chloride ions. And so they will then be surrounded by chloride ions. And then out and out, and you build and build these lattice structures. And a lattice structure, uh, that just means that you have a repeating pattern within the structure. Now, what does that mean on the macroscopic scale? So if you build these repeating patterns of atoms up and up and up and bigger well okay i said atoms this repeating pattern of ions up and up and up and up then you end up with crystals so on the macroscopic scale ionic compounds are going to look like crystals uh, and because they are crystals let's just sort of think about it what sort of properties would crystals have all right, so let's move on. Uh, so those ionic compounds, just think about a crystal. They are brittle. You cannot bend a crystal. You cannot hammer a crystal. They would shatter. So they are brittle. Uh, they have really, really, really high melting points. <clears throat> so uh, if you think salt is probably the most common one, but you cannot, you can pour salt right on your stove and it will not melt, not the way that sugar or other things will. In fact, if you heat up a frying pan, the frying pan will melt before the salt would melt. Uh, they are terrible conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, we don't really ever try to use them to conduct electricity. I can try that for you one day in class if you'd like. Uh, and then, so, but they're terrible conductors. The reason that they're such terrible conductors is that all of their charges are held in one place. So they don't have any, uh, the, the particles, the ions themselves are held in place, their electrons are all held in place, and so they don't have any little pieces that move very easily, and because they don't have any pieces that move easily, that makes them bad conductors. And lastly, ionic compounds are going to be water-soluble. So most ionic compounds, so we'll just take it to be all ionic compounds, can dissolve in water. Uh, that's because water has a positive side and a negative side. And so the positive side of water will surround the negative ions. The negative side of water will surround the positive ions. And then they'll end up being more attracted to the water than they are to each other. And so they will go off into a solution. This next slide you're already very familiar with. So it's what charge do the different elements take on? So we'll sort of ignore that plus or minus four column, but you know that all of the alkali metals and hydrogen take on a plus one charge. Uh, the second column, the alkaline earth metals take on a plus two charge. Uh, the things in this column tend to take on 
either always a plus three charge or have a plus three variety. Uh, the noble gases are always going to have a zero charge. The halogens, minus one. Oxygen, sulfur, selenium, minus two. And then nitrogen, phosphorus, and some of the guys down there, but especially nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, minus three charge. So this we know, and then the uh, D block, the transition metals, they take on a variable charge. So those transition metals, uh, transition metals tend to take on a two plus charge. So they almost all have a two plus variety. That's because they have two valence electrons. Oh, right there, yeah, two valence electrons. Some of them do weird and multiple things with electrons. They shuffle them around between energy levels. And so uh, in addition to having a two plus variety, they'll also have uh, copper has a one plus variety. Iron has a three plus variety. And then uh, when we name them, as you know, metals that have multiple ions must be distinguished when you name them with a, that's right, Roman numeral. And that Roman numeral is the charge on the ions. Uh, here's a list. So up until now, I haven't had you memorize the different charges that transition metals will take on. But now, and this should be on the back of your green sheet that you got on the first day of class. But if you want to jot it down now, copper has a one plus variety and a two plus variation. Uh, iron can take on a two plus charge or three plus. Silver is actually always one plus. Mercury, Mercury has a one plus and a two plus. Lead has a two plus and a four plus. Tin, two plus, four plus as well. Chromium, chromium has a two plus and a three plus like iron. Manganese, manganese can have a two plus, a four plus, or a seven plus. And then lastly, we have cobalt, two plus and three plus. So we need to get this written down, and uh, at some point in the next week, you need to uh, be able to identify what the different charge is for a particular metal. All right, I'm going to move on. Maybe you can pause it. I'm moving on. Formula units. So formula units are going to be the smallest piece of an ionic compound. It conveys the ratio of cations to anions. So whenever we write the chemical formula for an ionic compound, that is reflecting the formula unit. But we're going to draw a distinction between molecules and formula units. So there, the formula for sodium chloride is NaCl. But you are never going to have just one sodium atom bonded to one chloride ion. So one sodium ion bonded to one chloride ion. You're never going to find that in the world. So it's always going to be in these lattice structures. Whereas with molecules like water or carbon dioxide, they're a little group of atoms that are bonded together that travel around independently. So you will actually find H2O molecules, little groups of two hydrogens and two oxygens. Carbon dioxide, little groups of one carbon and two oxygens out there in the world. But you'll never find just one sodium ion and one chloride ion chilling somewhere out there on Earth. They're always gonna be bound together. So what this tells us is that smallest piece, that smallest whole number piece, but you know, so there's a distinction there. So repeating lattice structure versus little independent traveling groups called molecules. Uh, transferring electrons to form ions. So how do they end up with these positive charges and negative charges in the first place? So they can get them from a host of places, but they can also get them from each other. So if we think about how many electrons would have to be transferred when a sodium atom encounters an atom of chlorine? Well, sodium has one valence electron that it's looking to give away. Chlorine has seven valence electrons looking to gain an eighth. And so one sodium atom could transfer one electron to a chlorine. The sodium atom would become a sodium ion. 
the chlorine atom would become a chloride ion, and then they would then be oppositely charged and electrostatically attracted to one another. How about calcium to oxygen? How many electrons would have to be transferred? All right, calcium has two valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons, and so one calcium could transfer two electrons to oxygen, and then uh, the oxygen would be an oxide ion, and so it would just be two electrons that need transferring. Lastly, how many electrons would have to be transferred to create a formula unit of barium nitride? Barium has how many valence electrons? Two. And nitride has how many valence electrons? It has five. And so since nitride has five valence electrons, and it's looking to have eight, right? It's looking to gain three. Bar one barium is not going to be able to satisfy the electron needs of one nitrogen to make it nitride. So one barium would transfer two electrons. That nitride would still need one more. So you bring in a second barium, it transfers one electron, but it still has one electron to give. So you bring in a second nitrogen, and then it transfers its last electron to it. And then that nitrogen would still need two more, so you bring in another barium, and then that barium could transfer one electron, two electrons. So in a barium nitride, you're going to need three bariums with two of the nitrides in order to reconcile that charge and that electron transfer. Lattice energy. So this is the energy that uh, is stored when those positive charges and those negative charges actually would be the energy released, when those positive charges and negative charges are attracted to one another. Not all crystals are created equal. So different crystals are held together more or less strongly. Uh, the strength of that crystal depends on two things. First, the size of the ions. So smaller ions exert more attractive force than larger ions. That's because their charge density is higher. A smaller ion with the same charge as a larger ion, well, all that charge is concentrated in a smaller area for the smaller guy. It's more distributed in the bigger guy. So the smaller one is going to have more power per you know surface area. Uh, the larger charge beats less charge. So if you have a charge of three plus, you're gonna be able to exert more force than something that just has a charge of one plus. So what's more important, the size or the charge? So charge is actually gonna be the bigger factor. So charge is more impactful than size. So if I give you a list of ions to consider, uh, you need to first consider the amount of charge on each ion and then consider the size of each ion. And determine size, we'll use what we learned last chapter with atomic radius. So when categorizing, you'd consider charge first, and then size would be a secondary concern. So which of these would have the greater lattice energy, KCl or CSCl? Well, since they both have Cl, you can sort of disregard the Cl, right? It's going to be the same in both. So let's compare potassium ion to cesium ion. Potassium ion has a one plus charge. Cesium ion also has a one plus charge. So they're a tie in terms of charge. So we need to consider them in terms of size. So which one would be bigger, potassium or cesium? Cesium is going to be the bigger one because it's, what, two rows beneath it? So then uh, potassium is going to be then the, uh, since it's smaller, this is going to have a greater lattice energy than cesium chloride. Then we can consider rubidium bromide or rubidium oxide. And so the rubidium is the same in both, so we can sort of disregard the rubidium. And bromine or bromide has a one minus charge. Oxide has a two minus charge. And since the oxide has the higher charge, then rubidium oxide is going to have the greater lattice energy. And lastly, we have strontium oxide or sodium fluoride. 
So strontium has a two plus charge. Oxide has a two minus charge. Sodium has a one plus charge. Fluoride a one minus. And so since strontium oxide has the bigger charge, strontium oxide would have the greater lattice energy. Next, we're going to talk about metallic bonds. So metallic bonds, uh, what happens in a metallic bond is, so what holds a sample of metal together? What's holding a paperclip together? What's holding an aluminum can together? Why do those metal atoms stay together? And what do we know about metals? Metals are substances that are looking to give away their valence electrons. So what happens is you have this sort of uh, hot potato situation where you have a positive ion transferring its valence electrons to its neighbor, but then it passes its electrons to its neighbor and passes them and passes them and passes them and passes them, and they're all passing these electrons all around. And because there is this negative charge being passed all around, and then they are positive ions, they're going to be attracted to that array of negative charge. So it's something called, it's a model called the C of electrons model. And so these electrons, nobody ever has possession of those valence electrons. They are delocalized. They're just this pool of electrons that then the positive or cat ions are attracted to. The properties of metals. So they are great conductors of heat and electricity. Why are they so great? Well, they're great conductors of electricity because they have all those free electrons that they can go passing around. So if an electron comes in, they just zoop, pass it right on through. Uh, they're great conductors of heat because since their cations aren't locked in place, they can vibrate with a large degree of freedom. They also have all those electrons that can shake back and forth. And so they have lots of pieces that are free to move, so then they can pass heat along the way. Uh, their melting points are going to be lower than ionic compounds. Now, you know, metals have decently high melting points, except, I guess, for mercury. But uh, they have lower melting points than the ionic compounds. Uh, they are, metals are shapeable. So because their pieces can move and slide past one another, they're not locked in place, you can hammer them into shapes or you can stretch them out into wires or sheets. Uh, metals are also shiny. I didn't know if you guys know that, but uh, metals are shiny. And we can talk about the reason for that. And then uh, they are not water soluble, right? So you know this, that you can't, you, know, you don't have to rush outside and cover your car up when it starts raining. It's not going to dissolve away on you. And we make pipes out of copper. And so it's, uh, metals do not, you know, you, or, uh, you throw a coin in a fountain it doesn't dissolve away so they're not water soluble that's because the water molecules can't surround their charges their ions and pull them away uh, comparing and contrasting ionic and metallic bonds so what do ionic and metallic bonds have well they both have uh, so they're both type of bonds that both type of bonds have cations in them and in both, the cations are attracted to negative charges. The difference is going to be where that negative charge is located. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so the two types of compounds are drastically different because of the nature of the negative charges. All the physical properties of ionic compounds are related to the fact that their negative charges are locked in place. So because the negative charge is housed just around the anion, the positive ions, the cations, are then attracted to those anions. Everything's locked in place, not, not a large degree of freedom, no charge that is mobile, and so they do not conduct electricity, they don't conduct heat, they have really, really high melting points, and they are brittle. But because metals have those delocalized electrons, so the delocalized negative charge, so you have those free electrons, you have the cations that have a large degree of freedom. Metals are then great conductors of heat and electricity. Uh, they are not water-soluble, and they end up being shiny and uh, 
shapeable, ductile, malleable, all that stuff. So that is the end of Unit 3, and I hope this video wasn't so terrible.